part two of the series called The Bible. That's right, we're a church that preaches on the Bible. <laughs> like actually, we're gonna preach on it and what it's all about. This series is really exciting to me. I've been looking forward to it for a long time. Um, I don't know if I shared with, this, with you last week, but I actually um, started writing this series in October last year. October last year, I got this idea and this, I, it was the Lord, all right? Because I'm a pastor, it's always the Lord, right? But I had this, this idea, what if we took the five categories of the Bible and we took five weeks to just expound on what those five categories mean to us today? Because it's really easy, man, those history books, man, that's, that's, that's for somebody else. Oh, the, the poetry and wisdom literature, you know, I don't know, I'm not into all that artsy stuff, I don't need that. So... What I want to do, and hopefully by the end of this series, if you continue uh, to, to plug in with us, is you'll be excited to go home and dig in on your own to each one of these categories of the Bible because they all still apply to our lives. They all still matter and they bring unique perspective to our relationship with Jesus as we're, as we're growing that out. It comes from this scripture right here. Second Timothy chapter three says this. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what's true, make us realize what's wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we're wrong, teaches us to do what's right. God uses it, the Bible, the scriptures, to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. I like that. I like that. I like a good instruction manual for life. I like a good uh, a process, something I can follow, some, some way I can know. Because I don't know about you, but sometimes I can feel a little unsure. Am I the only one? I feel a little unsure. Am I, am I going the right way? Am I following the right path? Am I, am I making the right choice here? Well, guess what? God uses this word to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. So I'm excited to just bring that to you. And so my, my thesis, the concept for this series is this. A growing relationship with God means a growing relationship with God's word. A growing relationship with God means a growing relationship with his word because they're one and the same. Just this morning, I, didn't, I don't even skip my, my daily Bible reading on Sunday mornings, y'all. Like I got a lot to think about on Sunday mornings, but I still, I have to, I like to check those boxes. You know what I'm saying? I don't like to miss. And so I read the book of John, the gospel of John chapter one said, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. This word is important because it's God, it's, it's God in it's, it, we get to see all about him. It's all here. I, I love that so much. So last week we talked about history, the history books of the Bible. I recited them to you. I'm not going to try that today. It's all right. But you can go back and check that out. And we learned about how the, the greatest choice in history is the choice between life and death. And that's the covenant really that God made with us. And we see that in the history books of the Bible, starting with a man named Abram, whose name changed to Abraham, who God inserted his own name into him, Abraham, and that's when God made that covenant and said, I'm making a covenant with mankind. And the covenant is this, I will be your God and you will be my people. Oh, that you would choose life. I, I lay before you the option, life or death, the, the choice is yours. That's the covenant. If you choose God, he, he chooses you. He's already chosen us, but he's laying the choice before us. I'm not gonna preach it over again because you can go back and watch it. It's, it's great. So that was last week. Next week, okay, everybody, really Really excited about next week. Why? Because next week we're going over the prophetic literature in the Bible, which is to me one of the most exciting, underutilized sections of the Bible. That's all these prophets, you know, Isaiah, Nehemiah, all these people, all these people that are like, they, they have this forward thinking. Nehemiah's not one of them. It's okay. I got it wrong. That's fine. That's fine. All these prophets, especially Isaiah, I love him because he was looking forward to the Messiah. He was looking forward to Jesus. And he talks about all this. And next week we'll, we'll learn how many prophecies were really already fulfilled already fulfilled and how whether you're a science person a math person whatever it's mathematically scientifically like it's not possible for this many things that the bible's predicted to actually come true right. it's actually not even it's not math it's called a mathematical Im impossibility and i i'm, I'm getting ahead of myself because i am so so fired up like come at me come at me bro like if you don't believe the bible come next week Check it out. It's going to be amazing. You're going to absolutely love it. I, I promise. It'll be life-giving to you. But today, okay, I want to talk to you a little bit about um, definitely 
<laughs> for me, one of the stranger um, categories of the Bible, poetry. Poetry. Poetry and wisdom get lumped together. Thank, thank goodness that wisdom is this sort of poetry. It's like, what? Well, it's, it's kind of true that poetry and wisdom have a way of going together. Poetry and wisdom. You know, some of the, the best wisdom we have is poetic in nature. I'll, I'll, I'll show you this. A bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. Isn't that right? Like, you've heard that. It's, it means a bird in, that you have is worth grabbing two birds. And that actually is pretty weird. I don't know. It's kind of weird to me, but it's, it's wisdom. And it's kind of poetic in nature. It's like, who's grabbing birds in bushes anyways? It's weird. It's weird, but it's true. You've heard it. And here's this one you probably know. Don't judge a book by its cover. Again, a little hard to do because I'm looking at some of your covers right now. I'm judging. Okay, I'm just saying. I'm judging, right? Yeah, that's right. I'm judging right now. I'm the only person that I can see that's got a Christian man's jersey on right now. And of course, we know what happened with this guy right here, Mr. Carr. We know he got that big old deal. And he said to the press and he said to all America, I got a tithe on that. Got a tithe on that. And every pastor in America was like, that's right. And you know what he is now? He's a saint. He's a saint. Don't judge a book by his cover, all right? He might be wearing a Raider jersey, but he's a saint. Bless his heart. (laughs) How about this one? Uh, An apple a day keeps the doctor away. I'm pretty sure that's false, all right? Because I've eaten some apples and I've I've seen the doctor, all right? I could could eat too many apples. I'm a classic case of I can make anything unhealthy. I... Just apples all day, all day long. And the doctor's like, that's not true, okay? One apple a day, that's what you get. And then Pastor Tiffany's favorite, Pastor Tiffany's favorite, better late than never. (laughs) Better late than never. Oh, I got no laughs for that. No, that's actually my favorite. That's actually my favorite. Tiffany's always on time. I'm the one who's late. I I thought I was going to get a couple more laughs on that. No big deal. It's okay. I'm moving right along. My favorite, actually, my favorite, whoever smelt it. Thank you very much. Okay, yeah. Some of the best wisdom we have. Some of the, like, if you want to know who dealt it. That's not true. Okay. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Front row is getting live right now. I'm just letting you. Okay. Today is all about poetry. It's all about wisdom and these po- the, the poetic literature uh, found in, in the Bible. We're talking about the books of Job. Job is actually considered poetic. Uh, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. And uh, Lamentations, also considered to be poetic in nature. Just six books? That's a pretty small section. Well, hang on just one second. Did you know, did you know that one third of the Bible is actually recorded in poetic form? That means all throughout the Bible, like even in Genesis, Exodus, like they'll, they'll say one thing and then they'll sing it for a few bars. Yeah. I mean, if you notice that, that poetry is all throughout like, it's like God uses poetry. It's almost like he's insisting. Like, I don't want to just tell you how it happened. I wrote a song about it. <laughs> you know, it's like, I don't, what's, what's his deal? What's he doing? But one third, you can look this up on your own. One third of the Bible is actually poetic in nature. It's like God insists on bringing his truth to us in multiple ways, in multiple ways. It's like, uh, maybe you've heard this up uh, Moses. Moses brings the, the Israelites, he brings them out of Egypt, and he takes them through the, through the Red Sea, and, and, you know, it parts, and they walk through. And so the Bible, in Exodus, like, just lists it, just says it. And then as soon as he gets to the other side of the water, he breaks out into song. Like, <laughs> chapter 14 is... Okay, and then the, then the Egypt army was there, and then the water did this, and then it stood up, and then they walked through it, and then, that, and then it was over. And then chapter 15, Moses goes on like a whole like section. It's a whole song. It's like, I, I swear I just read this. And then he's singing about it. Why does God do that? Why does God, I, I believe God doesn't just want us to know about him. He wants us to picture him. He wants us to imagine him. He wants us to, to feel him. Today's message is for the artists in the house, all right? And you're like, well, I'm out. But I'm telling you, this is, this is, how, this is how God instructed his people to, to, to write the Bible. It's, it's really quite fascinating. Poetry fills in and colors in the lines that the facts outline. So God could have just given us the outline. He could have just said, do this, don't do that, done. He said, no, I want you to do this and I want you to do that but this is how it's going to be for you. Let me tell you what it's going to feel like when you know you're doing it right. This is what you're going to experience. 
I love that because we need both. Whether we want to appreciate that or not, I'm kind of speaking to you like maybe you're not into that, but maybe you are. Maybe you really appreciate Psalms much like you're reading, you're on your Bible reading plan and you're reading Numbers. Hallelujah. Just reading through Numbers. You're like, I cannot miss a checkbox, but I am dying. And you're like, thank the Lord for a Psalm today. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, just tell me what it's like. Um, let me talk to you about this. I got three, three ideas for you today that I want to flesh out. Number one is this. Poetry and wisdom are gifts from God. You can write that in your notes. Poetry and wisdom are gifts from God. He didn't, have us to, he didn't have to give us that whole other way of understanding him. He didn't have to do that. But the very first chapter in what could rightly be considered uh, the most poetic book in your Bible is Psalms. It's basically a bunch of songs that are written out. So you would rightly think that's the most poetic book, right? I would, I would agree with that. The very first one, Psalm, Psalm 1, says this. Oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or stand around with sinners or join in with mockers, but they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. We, he could have stopped right there. He could have stopped right there and said, you'll be joyful. If you don't stand around with sinners, you'll be joyful. He didn't stop there though. He continued. And I, I'm glad he did. Because then he goes on to say this. They are like, they are like trees planted along the riverbank, bearing fruit each season. Like no matter what season you're in, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna produce fruit. What else does he say? Your leaves will never wither. They prosper in all they do. So it adds this whole other layer of understanding what it means to not stand around with the wicked and join in with the mockers. People don't have leaves. I'm just like going to break some, I'm going to break your thinking today. I'm blowing your mind. People don't have leaves. We don't have roots. But how often do we even speak in poetry? We don't even realize we're doing it. You know, I just want my roots to grow down in Jesus. Bro, you got feet, okay? You don't have roots. You have feet. You don't have leaves. You don't have fruit growing out of your armpits unless you're a teenager. Bless your heart. Get some deodorant. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Parents understand what I'm saying. It's rough out there. Or tell your husband, you know, he's, he needs it too. It's shocking, honestly. Honestly, it's very shocking how much we're instructed um, and what we're instructed to do in poetic form. It's so often, in fact, we might not even realize it how often it's happening that we've kind of like muddied those waters in our mind. Like they're speaking to me in poetry, but I think I understand. God does this purposefully because of this. And you can write this in your notes too. Poetry gives color and shape to God's truth. Poetry gives color and shape to God's truth. So let's compare and contrast just briefly. Let's talk about David and Bathsheba. Maybe a story that some of you have heard, the story of David and Bathsheba. David was, was um, Israel's Second king, the good king, the man after God's own heart, right? We talked about this a little bit last week. The main guy, the main man of Israel, sleeps with his homeboy's wife, gets her pregnant, and then kills his friend. Like, this is one of his own mighty warriors. Not like he didn't know the guy. He did. Kills him. Okay, and then the, and it's recorded like this. In, uh, in 2 Samuel chapter 12, David confessed to Nathan, the prophet, I've sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, yes, but the Lord has forgiven you. You won't die for this sin. Story over. What? No, it's not. It's not over. There's tons that happens, but God is so gracious to us. He actually gives us what's going on inside of David's soul. And it's partnered in, in Psalm 51. Psalm 51, that, a, a, a very famous psalm that probably many have heard. Created me a clean heart, O God. Let's, let's just read it together. It's not on the screens. I'm just gonna read it to you. Created me a clean heart, O God. This is Psalm 51, verse 10 through 12. Renew a loyal spirit within me. So watch this. David's describing the anguish of his own sin. And we get to see what it feels like to have done something like this. And that's what makes it so relatable to all of us. Maybe you haven't done what he did, but we've all felt like this sometimes. Renew that loyal spirit within me. Don't banish me from your presence. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. We get to see because of poetry that in David's opinion, he lost his salvation for a moment. He was walking outside of God's love. He was walking outside of, of God's plan for him and he had lost and, and he's crying out to God, God, restore unto me the joy of your salvation. 
and it's a little bit blurrier because it's, it's more colorful. It's shades of what he's feeling, and it helps us to understand what he's going through in the midst of all that. Aren't you glad that God didn't just say, you know, this happened, then that happened, and that settles it? No, he gives us so much more to think about. He gives us so much more to process. It's instruction that's illustrated with poetry. Mm. How about this one? Uh, this is a good one. Malachi 3. This is, this is instruction that's illustrated by poetry right here. It, Malachi 3 says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so there will be food in my house. Done. Okay, so it's like just the outline, right? It's just the black border and here is what you do. You bring the tithe, you bring it into the house and you're done, right? No, the prophet Malachi actually goes on. But watch the way he goes on. He says this, if you do, and he's speaking on behalf of God. He said, I will open the floodgates of heaven. Does that mean if you start tithing, it's going to start raining outside? You're like, yeah, that's why I haven't been doing it. I like, I like the sunshine. <laughs> no, it's poetry. It's poetry. What he's describing that there's floodgates. Like imagine floodgates. There's like, it's like a dam. It's like you're, you guys, are, he's speaking to Israel. Malachi is, and he's like, you're dammed up. You're blocked up. But if you, do, if you start doing this, if you come back to doing this, they were doing it and he came back to doing it. And God says, I'm gonna, I'm gonna break open those floodgates and pour out a blessing on you so great you won't be able to contain it. You won't be able to contain it. That's poetry. He's using, he's using poetic form to describe a black and white idea. Like, if you do this, you'll be blessed. But let me tell you, let me show you what it's gonna be like. It's going to be like floodgates. That's good. That's really good. It's going to be like a, a refreshing. It's going to be like a, a time of prospering for you. And let me just tell you, another thing is that God's blessing is not reserved for just finances. I've, I've said this for years and I truly believe it, that when we engage in this, so like just hunkering down on that idea for a second, when we engage in this activity with finances, it's not just finances that come in return. It can be. It can be a result of that. You know, we get some financial breakthrough because we're honoring God first. That's absolutely true. But it's not limited to that. Blessing from God. Pour out a blessing on you. That could be in regards to relationships. That could be in regard to career. That could be in regard to health. Blessing comes in a lot of ways. And so we have here instruction that's illustrated with poetry. And I, for one, am really glad that God decided to do it that way. God was a poet, didn't even know it. Okay, all right. What does the fact that so many principles are, are brought in, in literal and poetic form mean to us? I would, I would say this, this is in your notes as well. Don't skip poetry, but don't try and live on it either. Don't try and survive on it, all right? So we need both. We need the outline, we need the border. I need you to tell me, God, what do I need to do? I'm a literal person. I'm a logical person. I've been thinking a lot about my personality types. A lot of us leaders are kind of like starting to process more of that. I, I know that about myself. I like, I like the specifics. I like the hard lines. But God said, I want you to be more than just one, one kind of person. I want you to think a little bit more broadly. I want you to color in those lines. And I want to show you what that looks like. So don't skip poetry, but don't try to survive on it either. Have you ever heard of the term uh, a starving artist? A starving artist, if you heard that, that's because artists often are starving because they don't get work, all right? Because there's not a lot of money to be made being an artist. You're either super wealthy, and that's like one out of a billion, and then there's the rest of us artists that just record an album and make nothing from it, and it costs you $7,000 to do it, all right? <laughs> and you get nothing in return. It costs you more than it makes you, all right? I actually did. I recorded 12 tracks on an album. I'm not giving any to you because I'm embarrassed about it. <laughs> It was just a bucket list thing, all right? It's, so, starving artist, but have you ever heard the term starving accountant? No. I don't think you have. Because accountants, they get jobs, and they keep jobs. And they, and it, so what I'm trying to show you is, if you bring an artist and uh, an accountant together, you're going to live in a beautiful and paid for home. <laughs> and that's Tiffany and I, that, that's our reality. Uh, we went through Financial Peace University years ago. Um, Dave Ramsey, the, the, the great Dave Ramsey, if you've ever done that, he, he does this process where he would do a little personality thing. You're either the free spirit, that's right, the free spirit or the nerd. 
It's like, come on, Dave, pick better words, but that's what you are. You're a free spirit sounds pretty good, right? The nerd, I'm not going to tell you which one's which. You can just guess, okay? Um, nerd and free spirit. But what he says is you bring both together, you're going to have a good situation on your hand. You bring a budgeter in with someone who's a dreamer, you're going to have a good situation on your hands. And that's how you want to have that art and science kind of coming together. You want to have poetry from God's word, and you want to have like the outline, the tell me what to do. Like, it's not legalism, that's kind of a bad word, but like, tell, show me. Tell me how to live. We need to have that side, but then we want to have the expressive side as well. If you read only Psalms and Proverbs, you might starve. <laughs> well, you, you probably be okay. It's still God's word after all. But if you, uh, if you uh, skip it, you're going to miss critical nuance that God wants you to have. So I don't want you to skip it. I want you to be excited to read it. I want you, I want you to read poetry and this wisdom, these wisdom books, and I want it to inform all the good things that God wants us to do, okay? Number two is this. True wisdom is confirmed in the Bible. True wisdom is confirmed in the Bible. This is kind of the meat of the message today. Uh, I'm going to break some hearts today. I'm sure of it, but it's okay. It's football Sunday. It's a fun day. We're going to have fun. Just hold on to your chairs a little bit, okay? True wisdom is confirmed in the Bible. True wisdom is confirmed in the Bible. There's lots of wisdom out there in the world today. Lots of it. There's good, bad, and ridiculous wisdom in the world today. But if it competes with or contradicts the word of God, we have to run the other way. It's the only thing we can possibly do. Jo so let me just show you how this kind of works. Uh, Job, who who is considered poetic, that's poetic literature. Job taught us that the world is round about 3, 000, at least 3,000 years ago. Could be a lot longer, but there's no scholar ever that doesn't think it's at least 3,000 years ago. But 3,000 years or even longer, Job says in the scripture, he says, God sits enthroned above the globe of the earth, the sphere of the earth, the circle of the earth. It's where we get the word globe from. It's in the book of Job. And back then, ain't nobody thinking that the world was round. It just wasn't, it was not, it was not commonly understood logic, but yet the correct thing gets into the Bible. How strange is that? Uh, here's some more fun ones for you. Moses, we've been talking a lot about Moses. Moses wrote the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, but he was raised by Egyptians, raised and taught and instructed by Egyptians. They were the ones that taught him how to read, how to write, all the understanding. Yet anything, all the things they believed didn't end up in the Bible. You know, the Egyptians believed that the world was flat and it was held up by five pillars. There's four on each corner and then there's one in the middle. That doesn't end up in the Bible. Yet Moses was instructed in all the wisdom of Egypt. Pretty crazy. How about in uh, Leviticus? In Leviticus, uh, there's a scripture that says the life is in the blood. The life is in the blood. And yet, just a couple hundred years ago, everybody, just a few hundred years ago, we, we still thought that if, if you're sick, we got to get that sick blood out of you. We got it. So we, we're going to put leeches on you. And we're going to suck that bad. It's called bloodletting. George Washington died of bloodletting. That's how recently we still thought. But if we just would have gone 3,000 years ago and listened to what the Bible had to say, no, the life is in. Now we know you need a transfusion. You need healthy blood to get in you. See, wisdom is found in the Bible. True wisdom. No matter what the doctors are saying, and I'm not saying that I don't believe in doctors. I'm just, if it's in the Bible, I need to put it first because in that time, that was very, how about this one? The bubonic plague killed like one quarter of the world. Is that right? Is that the figure I'm looking for? About one quarter of the world? Let's just round down. Say it was one fifth. <laughs> millions and millions and millions and millions of people died. Bubonic plague. There was no concept of contagions back then. People were just like coughing in your face. <laughs> How you doing today? Like spitting, shaking your head. They, don't, they didn't know. Yet in the Bible, if there was a sick person, what did they do? Let's keep them, let's quarantine them outside the camp. Because God's wisdom is true wisdom. But if we learn something that from our world, even now, that contradicts or runs counter to what's in here, believe me, I'm going right here. What I want to do, and I, I know I'm kind of going to make some enemies with this, but let me just set it up. Isaiah 40, verse 8, the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of God stands forever. Stands forever. This word, even if it doesn't make any sense, even if it says I'm, I'm, I'm supposed to do one thing 
and I'm, I'm not seeing the result, I'm still gonna believe it because the word of God stands forever. The grass, isn't that poetic right there? The grass withers, the flowers fade. It, it doesn't have to say it like that, but it gives us that picture that as the hot days keep coming, the things of this world are gonna fade. But God's word, it stands forever. It stands forever. That means this is trustworthy. It's dependable. We can count on this for our life. Are you seeing this? Are you seeing how important this is for your life? Because some of us are struggling with some things. And you're like, well, I'm doing everything that that person says to do. I'm doing everything that YouTuber says to do. I'm doing everything my boss says to do. I'm doing everything my auntie says to do. We want here. I want you to see it. That if God says to do something here, this is dependable. Why am I telling you this? Because counterfeit wisdom is abundant. But true wisdom is confirmed in the Bible. Okay, this is where the, the hearts start breaking, okay? I'm going to show you three levels of talking head wisdom that exist in our world today that I want to just prepare you for. It, you're my people. You're my family. So I, I need to equip you. I want to equip you. And I say it all with a grain of salt. You know, I'm setting it up kind of thick, but it's really not all that bad. <laughs> three levels of talking head wisdom that I just want to show you what to do. So Dave Ramsey, we already talked about him, right? Let's talk about Dave Ramsey for a second. He is a Bible-believing Christian man. Bible-believing Christian man who lives in the most Christian area in the entire world, Nashville, Tennessee, okay? If you're a Christian, you move there, it's like the Mecca, all right? That's, that's the new Israel. It's like the Holy Ground. That's where the new Jerusalem is going to descend. Awesome. I know. He is right there, he's, he's right there and he, he quotes the Bible, and what he says is, all of my wisdom is coming from the Bible. And I would say, largely, absolutely. I've been through his stuff. I believe in it. I would say, highly recommend. Highly recommend. Probably most of everything he says comes straight from the Bible. But him, just as well as any other preacher, you've got to live here. Because I, I can say a lot of words, but if we're not filtering everything through this book, and that goes for me too, and him, and anybody else, any other preacher, we need, we need to learn to have a relationship with this word where it comes first in our heart and in our minds. This word comes first. In, in, and that's even for somebody like Dave. Dave's a great guy. He's not Jesus. You know what I'm saying? Great guy. Great advice. Not Jesus, though. Not Jesus. Okay, how about the next one? This is middle ground. This, there's a guy on YouTube. I love him. His name's Andrew Huberman. Andrew Huberman. You might have heard of him. He's like a fitness guy. I really like the guy, personally. I'm just being honest. This is like, we're talking shop right now. I like the guy. He, he's, a, he's a scientist. He's like, studies human anatomy, understands it, and he kind of explains how you can keep your energy levels up, hormone balance, kind of all that stuff. And I, quite frankly, I use a lot of his advice. Morning sunlight, get some morning sunlight. It's good for your circadian rhythm, yada, yada, okay. It's been working. I have some salt in the morning. It's good for your hydration, okay, all right. Delay your morning coffee, because if you do, just whatever, little things. No, he said, I'm out. That's not the Bible. That's not the Bible. That is not the word of God right there. <laughs> that's funny. I didn't even think about that. But I do, you know. That's probably the least holy thing about me is that 30 minutes before I've had coffee is the least holy thing about me. But here's the thing. He's not a spiritual man. And if he is a spiritual man, he hides it very well, which says a lot about his spirituality if he has some. Okay? So I still, like, I take it with a grain of salt. So I still listen to a guy like that, but I'm very careful because if he says anything that, that contradicts right here, I'm out. I'm gone the other way, and I'm not going to do all that. So he has other advice about, like, you know, journaling or, or some other th practices that I'm like, ah, I don't know. I'm, I'm not going to do any of that. So there's like a middle ground person that I'm saying, and I, I'm not saying turn off the internet. I'm saying you need, to sh you need to have wisdom. We're talking about poetry and wisdom, right? So I want you to have wisdom. And I want you to, to look at these people because how about this last person we want to talk about? Joe Rogan. Let's talk about Joe Rogan for a second because if you don't listen to Joe Rogan, you have a friend who does. If you don't listen to him, you have a friend who does. He's wildly famous. High school education, got his start in stand-up comedy, and he talks about the most serious issues that life has to offer. And people treat him like he's the Messiah. Like everything he says is gold. Like, oh man, so like, I, uh, I was hearing on Joe Rogan the other day. I'm like, 
cool, 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 cool. Like, have you looked at, like, he says some wild things about, he gives Jesus a little nod. He says, oh yeah, those Christians, they're good. You know, you gotta love your enemies, but you know, Jesus probably was stolen out of the tomb. And you know what else you gotta do? You gotta, you gotta take some psychedelics to really understand your, 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 explore your inner psyche. Wait, wait, hold up, what? Like, it's wild. It's, I'm just saying, and, and here's the thing. He's entertainment. He's, it's, his show is really good. It's like, it's well done. He brings all these people on there and then he's using drugs on his show. So I'm, I, I shouldn't have to explain this really, but I don't, I don't throw, I'm not a throw out my TV kind of Christian. I'm not a throw out your TV kind of pastor. I'm not like, you know, gotta throw it out. You have to ha- be wise and understand that if that's entertainment to you, you need to know it's just entertainment and you're not pulling any life lessons from See, that's what I said I was going to hurt some feelings. <laughs> You're not pulling life lessons from this guy. All right? He's just, it's just entertainment. It's just absolute, absolutely entertainment. All of these people, Dave Ramsey, Huberman, Rogan, they all have cool things to say. And some of it might be true, I guess. They might, you know, even a broken watch is right twice a day, right? <laughs> they're funny. They're witty. They're, they're sharp. I'm not saying they're not. And some of it might be true, but true, lasting wisdom is confirmed in your Bible. Amen. I want you to just lean on this because it's real easy to get sidetracked. It's real easy to get distracted from the main thing. It's too easy. It's even easy for me. Again, I'm not a throw away your TV, turn off YouTube or else you're going straight to hell kind of preacher. I'm not. I'm just really, I'm not. I watch sitcoms. I love The Office. I watched it like 17 times in a row. It's crazy, but and I... I like all that stuff. I, I, I leverage it for entertainment, but there are, there are some sitcoms out there that are, like, are actively kind of like against church and they like say a bunch of stuff like in the very first episodes and I'm like, you know what? I can laugh another way. I can laugh because that, that gets into our hearts. I don't care who you are. It gets into your hearts. And so if it's just for entertainment, I can find another way to get entertained. I'm still gonna read books. I'm still gonna listen to podcasts, but the fear of the Lord is gonna keep me filtering everything through this book, the Bible. Keep me filtering everything through that. And if it's going to, it's going to keep me, the fear of the Lord is going to keep me from reading books and listening to podcasts that I know are not in line with him. I just don't need it because there's too many good ones to choose from. I don't need the bad ones. Okay. A little entertainment is not worth going off track from God. Absolutely. It's like taking a friend's advice over, over um, your parents' advice. It's very easy to do. They're cool. They understand you, get you. If, if, you, if you are a parent, you have kids, you understand, they want to start listening to their friends more than you. And if you look back and are honest with yourself, you did the same thing. All right? And even Solomon's son, um, Rehoboam, did that. There's a story in the Bible about that. And so all I'm trying to say is it's very natural to want to listen to what's popular, what's current, your friend. They're cool. You like them. It's natural to do that. But what we want is supernatural. Yeah. I want a supernatural life. I want supernatural results in my life. So I'm going to keep my eyes fixed right here and let the things of earth grow dim. And I'm going, to, I'm going to choose to focus on things that aren't coming away from him. Last thing, number three, poetry and wisdom teaches us to fear God. This one might seem strange, fear, what? I thought we were, I thought we were like Christians that were like, yeah, high five, everything go, fear, that's the other, other churches talk about fear. Now, let me explain fear a little bit. Fear of the Lord is a really, really important subject. It's important for us to understand, important for us to, to really walk in this. Fear means I believe God will do what he said he would do. I believe him. I trust him. And if you've read the Bible, that should put a little fear in you because what he said he will do and what he said will come to pass. Okay, it's, it's believing that he's mighty, he's, he's strong and loving, but powerful. Okay, this is, he's not simply buddy Jesus. He, we are friends of God. He's King Jesus though. Okay, he's the ruler, he's supreme. He, what he says goes. I need to believe in him. It gives me that sense of sitting up straight in my chair. Okay, God, yes, I will. Okay, God, no, I won't. That sense of, I believe you, God. I trust you. I believe you. We see the reality of God's power best through the imagery and poetry of wisdom. Watch this. It's, it's the difference between 
the feeling and the impression that a scary movie leaves on you versus a documentary. A documentary is filled with so many true facts, but I can still remember the very first scary movie I saw as a kid. Messed me up, man. It, oh my gosh, I was way too young. And my dad was doing crossword puzzle or something. Thanks, dad. Appreciate you. Scarred still for that. But it's like, all I saw was the opening scene. Can't describe it to you because just don't go, don't do it. Don't do it. And I was a little kid and the opening scene happened and, and I was like, I guess it's bedtime. <laughs> this is real. And I went straight to bed and I went like this. <sighs> and I couldn't sleep. And my mom told me, hey, these images, this is a true story. My, my mom described to me, Images that you see get locked into a safe in your mind and they never leave. So imagine the difference between just seeing a documentary. You know, this is, this is you know, gonna happen, that's gonna happen. It might lead you to, to some kind of change in your life. But when you watch a truly terrifying thing take place, it changes, it like instant reaction. And it changes your mindset. But watch this. This is, that's the unhealthy kind of fear. Watch this healthy kind of fear. Proverbs 9.10. Fear of the Lord is the foundation of wisdom. Knowledge of the Holy One results in good judgment. What does that mean? That means part one of our vision for everybody here that ever comes to this church is we want you to know God. That's, that's part one of our vision. We want you to know God. We want you to find community. We want you to discover your purpose and we want you to be a lifeline. But first, we want you to know him and not just know about him. We want you to know him personally. We want you to have a relationship with him. It's, it's relationship. That's what our church service is all about. We want you to develop a relationship with God and knowing him means how powerful and mighty he is. Knowing what he's capable of. When you know someone, you know what they're capable of. When you know God truly fully, then you know what he's capable of. You know that he can come through even when things are tight. You know that he can restore a broken relationship when it's of the Lord. You know that when your heart is broken and you're in, the, and you're in that quiet place, you know that he sees you because you know him. I want you to know him. I want you to know him. And that will result in good judgment in your life. And will put some urgency into what God says we ought to do. Listen to this. If my son, Evan, if my son, Evan, hears my voice. Just this morning, I had to use my voice on him. I had to get a little closer, use my voice. And his face was like, <laughs> the dream team saw me. They're like, ooh. Even the dream team was like, ooh. But my son was like, oh. If my son, though, doesn't hear my voice with a sense of urgency, what's going to happen when I tell him not to walk in the street when a car is coming? Yeah. He's, he's going to die. He'll die. I don't even like saying it, but he'll die. If he, doesn't, if he doesn't hear my voice and do something about it, he'll die. He will die. He needs to hear my voice differently than he hears the voice of his friend saying, oh, come on, come in the, come in the street. I don't see any cars. It's fun out in the street. Well, guess what? His friends don't have dad's perspective. I'm taller than his friends. I can see over the car. I know what a 5.0 liter engine sounds like three blocks away. Dad knows different than friends. So if my son doesn't hear my voice a little differently, his life is in jeopardy. That's a big, big deal. His friends don't have dad's perspective. I'm taller. I can see farther. We need to trust God's perspective. He's taller. He can see farther. He loves us different. This last idea, to fear the Lord means believing him over all others. To fear the Lord means believing him above all others. And there's a lot of others to believe in. That's why this is so important because there's a lot of voices out in the world. There's a lot of competing ideas oh, well, I know the Bible says to do this, or I think the Bible says to do this. Pastor says I'm supposed to do this. The Bible says I'm supposed to do this. You know, there's a lot of other things saying otherwise. There's a lot of other voices in all of our lives saying otherwise. We need to put his voice above all others. And that's what the fear of the Lord, which is primarily taught in poetry and wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It's the foundation Knowledge of the Holy One results in good judgment. Fear is good when it applies to this area, fear of the Lord. 
Our heavenly father who cares for us like no one else, who loves us like no one else, has perspective like no one else. When we know him, it causes trust in him. When I was first getting saved, I was taught this in a very extreme way. Like I, you could probably tell because I'm a Raider fan that I did have run-ins with the law when I was, I know. Don't judge a book by its cover. But I did, I learned this in a really extreme way about putting trust into my leaders, putting trust in God before I could see the results because I, I got saved in a rehab out in Stockton, the Salvation Army. And when I was in there, they were telling me I needed to, to be five minutes early for every meeting, like five minutes in one second. Like if it was 4.55 for a five o'clock appointment, I was late and I would get dinged. And if I got too many dings, I had to go to prison for five years, eight months. That was my, that was my suspended sentence. Five years, let's just say five years. So if I was late to a meeting enough times, I might have to go to prison. <laughs> Talk about trusting, saying, man, that doesn't make any sense. You better believe it. How about this one? I had to fold my bed with military corners, the 45 degree angle. And I'm like, what you talking about? If I don't fold my, if I don't make my bed right, I'm gonna go to prison for that. They're like, you can, you can go right now if you don't like it. <laughs> You're here as a gift, you know, like you could just go. I'm like, okay. But it's, it, it caused, it created a foundation in me of beginning to trust what I didn't understand. Of beginning to do things that I was being told to do that I couldn't understand. So guess what? When I was early to my job, when I got out of there every single day, promotion in like three months because everyone else was late. And when I, I was getting yelled at, you know, for no good reason, I would get yelled at in there for no good reason at all. And you just sit there and take it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm sorry. I didn't even do anything. Yes, sir. Uh, all right. And guess what? When you go out to the real world, this still happens. You get yelled at for stuff you didn't do all the time. And there's so many people that are not well adjusted for that. But I would go in there washing dishes over at Woodbridge Country Club. And they're like, you didn't do this. And I'm like, okay, I'm so sorry. I will never let that happen again. Knowing full well, I didn't do that. But I had been prepared for it because the fear of the Lord taught me that I, I just need to learn to trust him. God is my defender. They taught me things and I didn't understand them right away but it taught me that I need to trust him. So I learned this lesson in a really extreme way that I hope you never have to do. I pray that you learn it here now just because I'm sharing it with you. Listen, if, if God is showing you in your life, like what is, God, what is God showing you in your life right now that you're supposed to be doing, that you're supposed to be learning? What season, that's poetic. What season are you in? What what are your roots tapped into? Is it fresh living water or is it something else? Are your leaves feeling withered? What fruit are you producing? Joshua shared that at, at first. Went, what fruit are you producing? I want you to look at your life right now. Last thing I want you to do is just look at your life right now. What is God teaching you to do? What is he asking you to do that maybe you're saying, nah, that it's fine I can get by without it is there something in your life that that he's showing you to do my only ask you today is even though it's coming in a poetic way in the art of real life and you may not be facing prison time for not doing it I'm inviting you to do it because there's blessing waiting on the other side see that I will not open the floodgates of heaven over your life, he said. If you will return to me, if you will do what is right, if you will do what the word of God says, if you will do what I sent my prophets to show you and to talk to you about, see that I will not open the floodgates of heaven over your life. It's a simple invitation and it's a different application for every person because I believe no matter who you are, no matter how long you've been coming to church, no matter how long you've been saved, God is probably talking to you about something. He's probably talking to you about it. He's probably showing you something. If you look critically at your life, he's probably trying to grow you in an area. My invite that is even though it's coming in a passive way, even though it's coming in a non-direct way, even though it's coming in an artistic way, lean into it.
lean into it and let God, let God change your heart. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Father, I pray for open hearts, open minds today to actually walk into that new season that you've called us to. Thank you so much. Your word is so good to us that you don't just give us the parameters. You don't just give us the outline. You give us the color, the texture, the shape. You color it in, you fill it in. Thank you so much for that. And Lord, I, I do pray that if anyone is here ready to, to take a next step for you and maybe what you've been showing them in this season is full commitment to you, is full commitment to your word, walking into a new season, being a fully committed follower of Christ. If that's you today, then that's a step we can take together and we can take it right now. So if that's you and you're ready to start or restart a relationship with God, would you just lift your hand up for me? Say, that's me. It's all right. You can do it right now. Let's go. This is your moment. This is your opportunity. Amen. I see you. God sees you. Anybody else? <laughs> Let's pray. Everyone, right after me, just say it right after me if you believe it. Say, Father God, I give you my heart. I give you my life. Forgive me my sin. Make me new. Fill me with your spirit and show me the path that I should walk. Amen.